Alzheimer Speaks wants to welcome you to a special edition called Dementia Chats, where you will hear directly from the true experts, those living with a form of dementia. Well, welcome everyone to Dementia Chats. We are going to have an interesting conversation today on the topic of dementia and stigma. Has anything changed? Um, what are people's beliefs? What are they seeing out there? And how is stigma affecting them as they live? and ideas on what do we do about it. So for those of you that are new, I'm Lori LeBay. I'm the founder of Alzheimer Speaks and co-founder of Dementia Map. My mom lived with dementia for 30 years. So I get the whole stigma thing. Uh, we're gonna go around and have everybody introduce themselves one by one, and then we'll get into the conversation. So Harry, do you wanna go ahead and start and introduce yourself? My name is Harry Irvin. I live in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was diagnosed 18 years ago with Alzheimer's, but uh, I'm showing signs of vascular dementia now. And um, I always, I always try to tell people I have Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's does not have me. And that's something that we have to follow. Right. Thank you, Harry. Um, Bob, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? I've been, uh, I was diagnosed with vascular deterioration uh, six years ago now, and also Alzheimer's was a great combination for my future. But uh, I've been very, very active. Oh, I, I live in assisted living in a nursing home here in, in Connecticut. And this, this organization has provided support for me that's unbelievable. I am on Zoom meetings very frequently, and it's all about telling my story and about other stories about people living with this. And I always, like Harry, I always introduce myself as a person living well with dementia and a sort of snicker. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Karen, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Karen. Uh, we were just talking about the, the definition of diagnosis in 2014 is when I was initially diagnosed and it's changed several times, Alzheimer's, etc. So I just prefer to, uh, to say a, a mixed dementia, which is bits and pieces of brain change. And, uh, you know, they can call it what they want to. I'm not focused on it. And um, so that's where I am. I've, I'm uh, a member of the Dementia Mentors uh, Virtual Cafes, uh, DAA and DAI, and uh, also a local Corpus Christi group, uh, Dementia Friendly Community uh, that we're helping to educate, uh, which is great. Thank you. Fantastic. Kate, mm -hmm. you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Kate Lau. I'm from Illinois. Um, I was diagnosed eight years ago uh, with BVFTD, which is frontal temporal degeneration. Uh, discounting the first two years where I was misdiagnosed for Alzheimer's. And um, um, those two years were not good because there are no medication for behavior variant frontal temporal de degeneration and old dementias. I don't think there's a cure, but it helps us to to uh, live our lives as healthy as we can. Um, so um, other than that, um, I, 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 don't, I, I want the public to know or the audience to know that the diseases that I am going to talk about does not necessarily, is not necessarily or are not related to my dementia. We often think that every little thing that happens is dementia, but it's not. I have a condition called hypogamma globin. Uh, it is a blood disorder. And at this point, I'm getting IVIG. And uh, we will see where that goes. And uh, also, I have uh, several kinds of immune diseases and uh, uh, cervical spondylosis um, myelopathy. So, but not necessarily dementia related. I don't know. The doctors are still working on it. Thank yeah. you. 
but everything affects everything else, you know, um, and most people have more than one issue, health issue that they're coping with. <clears throat> That's something that everyone has to be aware of. Lonnie, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm Lonnie Schicker, and um, I live in High Point, North Carolina. I am um, diagnosed with Lewy body dementia and um, have had four diagnoses before this one. I think that we all go through that. Um, and um, I was diagnosed originally in 2015, and I have had recently a bit more progression. Okay, thank you. Dale, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay, well, I'm uh, Dr. Dale Anderson. I'm uh, at 88, coming on to 89 this uh, next month. And uh, I have many, many genetic problems. And I have uh, just like to encourage uh, all of us that genes are not your destiny. Uh, uh, mine started uh, when I was found that I had cholesterol. Uh, in uh, when I had uh, uh, di diabetes, and uh, and then uh, my reading dyslexia, I I flunked the fourth grade, uh, and then uh, so I had to learn how to read better. My dad also had this, and and his uh, whole family of eight kids, all of them have had uh, cholesterol problems diabetes problems and I've had that I have the diabetes too and and then of course the Alzheimer uh, thing and as a physician that I've seen all of these people get better and get well it has become very obvious to all your physicians and ask them if genes are your destiny and I would say no genes are not necessarily your destiny and if if I know how to get out of cholesterol, I, I have great cholesterol now. I've had one heart attack, but I, my cholesterol is in trouble. I have uh, reading dyslexia, and uh, I have uh, a problem with that. I, I have to read very slowly. And then with uh, all these things together, I would just like to say to myself, too, with with Alzheimer's, genes are not your destiny. Okay. And Pam, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Yep. I have vascular dementia, and I've had that not real long. Um, and so it's just kind of trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. Um, I seem to do really well, so that's not a problem, but of course that can change over time. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and get started on this uh, topic of stigma and, and Bob, I'm going to throw it to you first, if you don't mind. And, um, how how do you see stigma affecting you or or do you not deal with it at all well stigma kind of interesting uh as soon as you're diagnosed you start to feel stigma immediately and that's because of all the the stigma that's placed upon us by our society there's something about the word stigma there's something about the word dementia that immediately treats you in a certain way what I found initially was even my family, even my family would say, well, how do I deal with it? Or they go quiet, or they go loud, or they go here, they go there. Now, it's six years now, and I'm living in assisted living, and we have trained what they call CNAs, and 50% of them live with our stigma, and they have no idea. They treat us like kids. Like just this, just today, just today, right? Oh, God. And there, when you're treated like a kid, when you're 90 years old, that goes right to your soul. And that can be, uh, if 
there's 133 people living here where I live. And if one person says it's sick, 130 people are treated like they're sick. There are very positive things living here. And I treasure all those positive things. But at night, when you're alone, sure. it's alone. Well, thank you. Um, I think that that is important uh, that you mentioned family and professionals alike, you know, struggle with stigma. Um, Harry, how about you? What are your thoughts? You've been living with the disease for quite some time. Stigma is not going to go away until we stand up to it. Right. Okay, now, uh, like I said, I've been living with this for 18 years and I've been fighting that battle. I've been letting my feelings get hurt because of what people think of me. But then I got to a point where I, I thought to myself, they're not going to do this to me anymore. Okay. I stood up to the stigma. If somebody is just the other day, we were at Home Depot and the and the salesperson was was rude. Okay. And I I said to him, I says, yeah. Yeah. Are you just having a bad day? Or are you naturally rude to people? And he was offended. Well, that's what I wanted to. I wanted him to be offended. I wanted him to say that that you don't treat people like that. And unfortunately, the pandemic had a lot to do with what we're going through now. Okay, like uh today this afternoon is going to be the first time that we have an in-person memory cafe at the hospital after two years mm. okay now we had not we being the advocators of this disease we have not been out there telling the stories because of the pandemic, you know, and people fell back into the old, well, grandma, grandpa had, so they can't, they can't talk, they can't do anything. And I'm here to tell you, I live, I live by example. Now, all indications say I should be dead for 13 years. That's that's the that's the average, you know. But I gave somebody on the the functionality, what they can do. Now, if you look at my cognitive scores, my cognitive testing, you would say, hmm. How are you going downhill? But if you look at what I can still do, like I just picked up a new hobby using a 3D printer. Mm. You know, and it took me a little bit of time to learn how to do it, but we can learn. We can do things. And I think that's why my misunderstanding now. I lost it, I'm gonna be honest with you, through the pandemic, I lost it, but it's coming, the fire is coming back in me. And we have to do something now to turn this around. This is almost like going back in the very beginning when all time has just had a bulletin board that if you would ask them a question, it would take them three days to respond to it. And we said, there has to be a better way. Well, you know what, we're saying that today. There has to be a better way. And 
unless we group together and start fighting this stigma, it's never going to go away. I just congratulate Harry because he's very, he, he's very inspirational. I would agree with that too. You're, you're doing an act, you're getting an act together and uh, you are on the stage that everybody are watching. So uh, it's uh, learning how to uh, act changes your, your chemistry and their chemistry. And I think you brought up a really good point, Terry, that, you know, we were, we were making progress and then COVID hit and everything pulled back. And like you said, a lot of the memory cafes, um, you know, stopped existing. And I know myself, I got kind of mad going, where is everybody? Where are all these dementia friendly communities? And then I had to like slap myself in the face and go, Hey, they're all working three jobs in healthcare because they're short staffed and people can only do so much at a time. And and a lot, you know, a lot of organizations didn't convert over to virtual. Um, but some of that had to do with, you know, we only thought this was going to last a couple of months. And then here we are, you know, into our third year of this thing. And, you know, things have changed. And, and I think, I think we have fallen back in some ways, but in other ways, there's been a lot more expansion virtually over the years. Um, where people are reaching people in a different fashion as well. But you're right, stigma is not going away. We need to get more and more people with dementia talking about this and, um, you know, what life is really like. Go ahead, Harry. I, I kind of disagree with you, Lori, because um, now I, I used to have six memory cafes a month, mm -hmm. six different ones, mm -hmm. you know, and we would average maybe 40, 50 people at these memory cafes. And then when we stop, we went to virtual. And I found out that the people that need us can't do virtual. You know, so we sort of, we sort of put them aside. It's easier if we can get together, have our spouses or care partners bring us in to a public meeting and talk. You know, that's, what, that's what's gonna change. Not, not, not the education, you know, because unless you live this disease, you have no idea what it's like. Yeah. None. You know, I, I talked to many, many, many professional people that know it all, they know the symptoms. They don't know the emotions of this disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the key. Yeah. We have to get over that part of who cares about the medical part of it. That's not going to change. What will change is how we live. Well, and it's, it's about um, looking at abilities and, and how do you adapt and how do you, like you said, move through those things. And one of the best teachers is talking with people in the trenches, um, sharing experiences. Uh, that's what I see the power of, of memory cafes being. And I think, you know, in person is always ideal, but there are groups out there that have actually reached more people. So it, de it depends on the dynamics of of the groups as well in terms of what's working or what's not. All I know is we've got a lot less of them through COVID that are active, virtual or in person. And that's not a good thing. You know, we need, we need even more. Um, and so it, it's gonna be interesting going forward, but there also have been more services coming through online um, that people were able to tap into um, which was helpful for some, but not, like you said, not everybody can, um, not everyone has internet access or equipment, let alone is able to work it. So, I mean, there's lots of dynamics, you know, at play, you know, with all of that for sure um, on that. Um, Karen, how about you? What are your thoughts on, on stigma? Uh, wow. So I have, um, problems talking <laughs> lately. <laughs> I think Lonnie had said something about her, her decline or whatever. I've, I've gone through since June about putting my thoughts together and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, uh, 
the stigma when I first got into advocacy here in Corpus Christi, uh, you know, I was able to speak, you know, and share my story and stuff. And the, again, my mindset with stigma is education. Uh, you know, that education that uh, all I remember when, when I got diagnosed was my dad was in late stage Alzheimer's and all I saw was my dad in late stage Alzheimer's. And so I knew my life was over, didn't know one soul. And I've talked about, I probably every group I come in, I talk about the support and stuff. Um, but the, the image I think most people I had is of an older person slumped over in a wheelchair, drooling, and you know, unable to communicate. Um, and so there is no life after diagnosis. And so that's all I saw for myself until I found all of these incredible, incredible support groups, advocacy groups, um, information. Uh, but, but more importantly, uh, like we're talking here is these workarounds, you know, um, I'm at a stage I haven't quite accepted my instant memory loss. I haven't figured out the routines that used to work with the asterisks and the alarms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there is a workaround. I just haven't quite bent into that. And so I keep coming to groups and I'll hear something and I'll pick something up and I'll leave something. And that really, I don't know where I would be without support from people, peers, and people like you, Lori, and uh, groups, and uh, cafes, and all of that. Stuff. So it's so important. The stigma, when, when I share just, just recently, um, I lost the sound on my cable yesterday, day before yesterday. I know it was error on my part. I called my cable guy, and I said, hey, I lost the sound on this. I have memory issues. And immediately he said, I just lost my dad last month from Alzheimer's. And so he was able, I mean, this, it was just this whole education of, and so they write on my chart, you know, has memory issues. So if this happens again, uh, even though I wrote it down on a card this time and, you know, all of that, you know, all of the things that we're supposed to do, it, it's all of these workarounds, all of these ways that I can live life well with my uh, you know brain change and uh, do it independently so far and eventually I'll be able to accept going into um, assisted living or, or whatever else so the stigma is hard it's, it's more of a, a teaching moment for me but I do get really frustrated when they keep on well how can you be doing this if you're you have this kind of thing Sorry. <laughs> that that questioning of of abilities I have found fascinating and frustrating and um, angers me. And I know many people with dementia have said they've gotten bullied going, well, my husband can't do that. So you shouldn't be able to do that. Exactly. You don't really have it. You're just faking it. And I hear people say that and I'm like, no one is going to fake dementia. Come on, guys. Really? You know, this is this is not something that you want to have. And I have seen the, the de uh, desperation and the depression and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when people are attacked. But then I also see the groups that surround the peers coming in and lifting people up and go, don't you dare go away. We need your voice. You know, this is just one in a few that is, that is and your voice is very, very important. And so um, I think that that was a wonderful point that you made there um, for sure. So thank you. Thank you for all those um, good tidbits. And there are so many wonderful resources. And again, by sharing voice, that's how we spread the word of all these other services and groups that are available out there to people. We, we need to let people know that there's hope and there's a place to talk and you know if people are listening and you're living with dementia you can be part of this group you know we're we're not just a you know a, a little um one and done thing everyone is welcome to be part of the group um and to raise the voice and utilize the platform and there are there are others like this as well so um don't be shy you know 
check it out and um and see what you think but you you have more knowledge than you think you do mm. go ahead bob can i ask you a question <clears throat> you've been at this now a number of years mm -hmm. and god bless you for the work you do because <laughs> it really you've saved and it helped so many people my question is what is the one thing that people with dementia should do to help to change the stigma? What is the one thing? Uh, they have to get active and speak out. They, okay. they, have to, they have to not be afraid. And we will never have enough advocating groups out mm -hmm. there. Um, but, you know, when I got into this because of my mom's dementia, I was frustrated because there there really wasn't much for groups. There was the Alzheimer's Association and that was it. But there really weren't any other supports like, you know, Dementia Action Alliance, um, Dementia Minds, there's, there's Dementia Mentors. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on with all the different groups that are out there. Um, and I just felt like we need to connect. We need... As, as much as I think one of the biggest things that I hear people say is, well, I, I don't, I don't know enough. I, I, what can I speak out on? I don't, I don't know anything. You're living with the disease. You know, a lot, you know what it's actually really like. Everyone else is guessing. So we need to hear your voice. It's extremely powerful. And that's how things change. That's how we grow as a society. Um, that's how we, you know, inch by inch, um, pound down these stigmas that are out there. And, you know, one of our biggest stigmas when I first got in here was, um, I, can't, I think it was Craig, he mentioned it, that everyone thought you had to be old in a wheelchair, you know, and drooling and you don't communicate and you're living in a nursing home. Well, look at you guys, not one of you fits that, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's many, many, many others out there that in people, even in early stages that are still driving, still working, um, you know, so we have to change what this disease is. It's not like, uh, well, it's kind of like old time cancer. You know, it was it was one thing, and now all of a sudden, there's all these different types of cancers that have um, different outcomes, that have different symptoms, that have different treatments, and you know, we're finally starting to understand that more. But we are in the really initial stages. I mean, even just for us, I think one of the big things in terms of stigma that's changed since 2009 was everybody used to call it Alzheimer's disease. And now people know there's dementias, there's more than one kind. They might not know specifics, but it's broadening. Um, and yet there's still a lot of people out there saying, well, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And, you know, so it's a, it's a start, though. Um, can I, can I, uh, what's so interesting is there's no stigma against having cancer. <laughs> there's no stigma against having other diseases. There's no stigma. Well, you know, it depends on how you define stigma. I mean, I don't think like dementia and cancer, I don't think anyone says, hey, sign me up. You know, it's, it's not something they want to do. That's because they have a disease. Uh, well, I know, but they are. Are you telling me, you telling me there's a stigma against having cancer? That people are treated differently. You ask I pretty much. I believe you. Sorry. Oh, yeah. People are treated differently. Um, and there are people that pull away, just like when people get divorced, some people pull away because, and it gets back to Harry talking about emotions, emotionally, they can't deal with that change. They can't deal with maybe, maybe they're going to lose somebody. So I think there are stigmas. I don't think it's to the extent people don't get blamed or being told they're faking it, you know, with cancer, like, like you guys um, get. Um, I think there's a much more, uh, a much better understanding of the disease. And there's usually, I think with the cancer, and I don't know, I probably shouldn't say this, but I will, but I think there's more of a, a, a physical look versus, um, you know, that you're ill um, versus with dementia, you know, everybody looks great, you know, so I, anybody looking at us right now, wouldn't be able to tell who has dementia and who doesn't just by looking at us. Um, but with some other diseases, you know, it's, um, it's more evident. 
um, in, in their being and not all the time, but you know, at times, but I, I do think when people get, um, any type of terminal illness, I think there is a stigma to that. Um, Carrie, mm -hmm. we, we talk about education so much mm -hmm. and I think we have to be educated. Mm -hmm. We have to be taught how to overcome these stigmas. Now we can we can sit around and we complain about it. Uh, we all see it. You know, I've been called some of the worst names you would ever believe in the past years, mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to handle that. But if you insult me now, I'll bring you to tears. I'll, I'll bring you down to your knees. And it's because I learned how to handle the stigmas. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what everybody has to do. Everybody has to learn how to handle these stigmas. And until you learn how to handle them, it's going to bother you. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect your health. You know, now, <clears throat> as you know, I'm very involved with the Italian group Sentimenta. And they, they take a more holistic approach to caring for somebody with living with dementia. As an example, here in the States, when you get diagnosed, the first thing that happens is your doctor says, here's a prescription, I'll see you in six months. Have a good day. But the sentimental model says we have to treat the disease, the person. We have to help them find ways to overcome. And Adapting to this this disease is 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 the most important thing you have to learn. The people that that live long lives living with dementia learn all these things. They learn how to adapt. Like I don't watch the news anymore because if I start hearing about the Ukraine. I break down. It breaks my heart. Well, honestly, I don't have to know that a hospital was bombed and 150 children were, were killed. I don't need to know that. Do I care? Of course I care. But I care too much. It affects my life. And I learned that, that I can't... I can't listen to that. I can't be around negative people, people that bring me down. Okay? If I'm around somebody that is constantly complaining, the first thing I ask him is, what are you doing to help yourself? Well, it's just the way it is. No, it's not. No, it's not. You gave up. I don't want to hear it anymore. Go away. And uh, you, you have to learn that if you want to live along with you. Yeah. Yep. yep. Agree. Um, Kate, what are your thoughts on stigma? Everyone has such, such, such great um, input about what stigma is. I'm like listening, learning. I think that... Um, Oxymoron. Um, more and more people are beginning to uh, join support groups. <coughs> okay, this is my take. Um, this, for example, I am an admin in the Harris Group, which is the founder and the CEO, and uh, and uh, we have an umbrella under Forget Me Not of all almost all the dementias. And we also have fun groups in it, um, workout groups and everything, because we, we know, we understand that there's people that just don't want to 
be classified as just dementia, the, the, the name, but you know, you're not who the name is, you know, that doesn't define you. Mm-hmm. So there's recipe club, there's fun page and all kinds of things. Well, when I welcome the new members, it's very hard to say, welcome to our group, right? Because mm-hmm. it's almost like, oh, welcome to our group. The reason I feel a bit uh, difficult about that is no one wants to meet at the dementia group, but for the support. So um, when I was first diagnosed, I had nowhere to turn to. And then I Googled dementia groups, whatever, and then I, uh, and then I found one group and another one, and which one you know, I feel comfortable in, and I feel um, uplifted. Um, and fun. So um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I'm talking to the the people that's uh, still liking my page and I have not written in one year because I cannot string my words together. And um, what it is is after one year, but then every day I'm thinking of the people that's waiting to hear from me because I have likes every day, you know. It's like, well, you know, it's a year. But what do I do this? I need help. I cannot, you know, write about this. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about stigma, you know. I, I think they don't even understand the word stigma. I seriously don't think they do. And if they do and they're, kind of, you know, criticize us like, oh, you know, you can still talk like you do. I don't think anything is wrong with you. I want to hit them, (laughs) but I restrain myself. Um, It's just difficult. It's just, I I have no word for it. Like Harry handles things differently. Uh, All our symptoms are different. Every one of us. When somebody gets loud with me, I shrink. I, I just actually feel and see myself shrinking into nothing. And I don't talk back, and I'm a talker, but I don't talk back. I, I kind of retreat into myself, and it's like there's a shell that I crawl into, okay? Not everybody feels that way. And I get intimidated, and I totally lose all my words, and I don't know how to fight back. Yet... I found myself fighting back um, on a couple of occasions because I just felt like my head is exploding and I've got the what they call the um, ice pick headache that people have with FTD, okay? Uh, if I say this to somebody who has another dementia, they wouldn't understand it, but they're not going to say, you don't have dementia. <laughs> and we cannot, I can feel the sadness But I cannot cry. I cannot show my emotions. And that's apathy that I have because I have BVFTD. It's not that I cannot feel. I feel, but the the frustration is I cannot express it. Mm -hmm. So at a funeral, when I don't cry and I I just stand there and just my best friend. And I, I could feel people like a lot of people looking at me and I talk to other people, you know, they probably think, well, everybody handles, you know, their grief differently. But no, when we have dementia, there's many things that you don't know. So um, I am speaking from what I have, my behavior variant, frontal temporal degeneration. Harry comes with his um Alzheimer's and his symptoms are different you know he finds other ways <coughs> to make his life very positive and um, I find other ways where my heart leads me it's not only about dementia we can do other things I'm working with children um, who are abused who are, who are abandoned because um, I have experience with that so we are all still productive and, and mm-hmm. doing very positive things. Yeah. 
Well, and I think that that's really important when when people see changes. Like you said, you can't express your emotions. It's not that you don't necessarily feel them. You mm-hmm. can't express them. I've heard others say they don't they don't feel anything either. So it just depends on you know, where they are in the progression and, and the type of dementia that they have. Right. And, and I do think people are starting to figure out that all dementias aren't the same, that it's not just Alzheimer's, it's not just memory loss. But boy, we got a long way to go in terms of all the other complications that this disease um, can have. Um, Pam, how about you uh, and stigma? What are, you, what are your thoughts? You said you're fairly new to your diagnosis. Yes. Um, but have you, have you felt sick, stigmatized or that people don't understand? Well, uh, no, I mean, I've got a, a, a group of, um, friends, you know, some in different parts of the country and we communicate, but, you know, the one who, who so wants us to fix me mm-hmm. is my daughter, she thinks I'm not okay the way I am. And she wants me to, you know, go to these different doctors that, you know, pay thousands of dollars. And, I, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. It, mm-hmm. You know, he's not helping me. Yeah. Well, and uh, you brought up a really good point, because I think a lot of a stigma has to do with other people not wanting to accept yes. reality. And so they're diverted, you know, and they're, they're trying to cope with it in a different fashion. And I think a lot of people have no idea how much um, harm or how hurtful that can be to the person because they really think they're trying to help yeah but but you had said you know well she doesn't want me to be like this well gosh you know just stab me in the heart you know (laughs) I don't want to be like this either (laughs) you know I'm sure it's what everyone else is thinking but this is my reality Mm -hmm. and I have to cope with it Mm -hmm. and and so again I think sometimes people are so focused on trying to help or trying to fix it Yes. And and there's not a fix other than at this point, learning to live with it and learning to adapt and, and still finding purpose in maybe different ways that you, you didn't prior, um, mm-hmm. but staying connected is I think really critical. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, Dale. Oh, go ahead, Kate. You had a comment. Yes. I, I uh, forgot to mention this. Uh, earlier on uh, when I talk about welcoming new people you know um, Mm -hmm. they're getting the support from all these wonderful people from different groups who are like us you know Mm -hmm. we we share our and uh, when I welcome them it's not that oh I am happy that my group is bigger you know it is more like I am happy more people are going out there on the internet and look up groups Mm -hmm. so the more people there are who does this um the more educated they are and they are actually helping themselves also Mm -hmm. exactly um karen yeah just uh i really appreciate what you said uh with your daughter pam that uh i had a whole family uh whenever i was diagnosed uh, i've been in 12-step programs so i knew that there was probably Mm -hmm. a group uh, uh, on a support group for people who had family members with, with uh, Alzheimer's or love, uh, you know, dementia and stuff. And then I got into my, my own thing. Well, sure enough, there was another group for that, another group for that. And, and I think when I started letting my family know my siblings, uh, it wasn't so much, I mean, the pain is horrible, you know, on all, 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 uh, all sides of this is horrible, but for, for me, and I didn't have it right away to have these availabilities, these support groups or a phone number uh, that my, my uh, siblings could call and talk with somebody to let them know that I wasn't the only one, that kind of thing. So I really appreciated you, you bringing that up. There is help on, uh, in my opinion, on all sides of this. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good point. Dale, how about you? Have you felt stigmatized since your I, diagnosis? Well, I, I do, but I think we uh, can all have, and it's been really good to hear from all of you because I think all of you uh, 
know that there's an inner pharmacy. And I would just uh, like to ask all of us, if you ever were on the stage, uh, and uh, with the actors that I've gone through, when they're in a downer part, they're sick, and they're and they're not uh, they're not having good health. When they're in the upper parts uh, and the happy parts, their physiology changes. And this just isn't just a maybe uh, think that it is, but we can go and and do a, a, a some work on them, and we can tell that they're. Uh, uh, chemistry changes. So if any of you here are actors or have been in the theater and you're in the upper ones that got you feeling well and you love doing that and you got in the downer ones, did you take that physiology home with you and share it with your family? I'd like to say if you if you get your act together and you bring it up where you're, <laughs> where you're, where you're laughing or something, or 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 something that you are on. I'm trying to do a survey of actors right now. What 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 group would you like to? Uh, what what act would you like to be in again? What one wouldn't you want to be in again? And what you will know. And at are in, if any of you are actor, you will know that you get into the the chemistry physiology of the part you're going to be on stage and you carry that home and uh, what can we do that with Alzheimer's well you know Dale I think that's a good point because um, one of the things that I hear from so many people living with with dementia is even participating in this or running a group or speaking at something you know they pull things together and 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 they do really well and they're very proud of their work which they should be um but many say that it helps fend off a lot of their symptoms but when you have to pull that much energy in to kind of lift yourself up and present yourself you can be exhausted for two days after the fact too <laughs> from that presentation um, but I have heard more and more people say becoming an advocate, taking a stand, having their voice heard, having a purpose has really helped fend off their symptoms. And, you know, they felt that they've been able to live longer. I wanted to ask you another question, Dale, and that is because um, your late wife, Annie, had dementia, too. Did yes. you see people treating her different? Because that's really what stigma comes down to is did yeah. you see people pull away or, you know, make comments or treat her different at all? Uh, no, but she was having problems for some time and she had to go back to be with her uh, kids in Salt Lake City. And it wasn't very long after that, that she passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so Annie was really great for me, but she was, uh, unfortunately, she's no longer with us. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah, those two were quite the pair. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, we were only in Lena's when we went to park. I mean, all of these things. And when you change that, your chemistry into the act you're doing, mm -hmm. we can now measure it by science mm -hmm. that your chemistry is different. And each and every one of us has a divine pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And we are the pharmacist. Good. Well, thank you. Anybody else want to add anything else about stigma? Wanted to wrap things up. Uh, Kate, you are on mute, but go ahead. As we're sharing today, I, I, as always, I find myself going off tangent instead of just, you know, focusing on stigma. And that is part of my dementia. Okay. And uh, Harry has said that how he feels, you know. So here we are today. This is dementia. How we cope with it is dementia. But I hope that, you know, people would understand that, that after this, after I've come to this uh, chat, I might fall asleep very, very soon because it takes so much energy. But I want to be here mm -hmm. and I'll probably go to bed for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for spending your energy with us. Go ahead, Karen. I just wanted real quickly, uh, I think we were, while well, we were talking about the stigma uh, and 
for, for myself, when I'm having somebody, uh, when I need help, I need somebody to work. I call them care partners, uh, work with me, not for me. Mm -hmm. I need somebody to do my medications. I need somebody to monitor what I'm doing. I need assistance. And the, the further along I get, maybe the more I need help, I'm sure. But I need that education on that person's part to know, you know, and I have a perfect person right now. I just can't afford more than two hours a week. But uh, she, you know, this looks like trash. But um, what do you think, Karen? And I'm like, oh, trash, you know, and it's like I had the control. So it makes a difference makes a big difference when you feel like you're in control and yep you know our physiology changes when we started this group and now when we're ending this group and the physiology is different now and it's much better and it's uh, i thank you so much for getting into my inner pharmacy (laughs) and uh, i hope i can come back again and get another prescription (laughs) great thanks dale um harry anything else you want to add no i'm 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 fine i just want to go out and sit on my bench okay it's nice out (laughs) yeah you wouldn't want to do that in minnesota it's going to rain and kind of maybe snow a little bit on and off all day today so (laughs) good for you i want to say one thing you know when you talk about the oli and lena jokes Mm -hmm. My dad had this great friend who was always so, so funny. And I'll have to remember that because it's just such a charming thing. So, yeah, it's okay to be happy. Yeah. Well, and Dale and Annie weren't just telling jokes. They dressed up as them. They dressed up as Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy. (laughs) And um, they had all kinds of costumes and were just so, I mean, as soon as they walked in the door, they were just this bundle of joy. And it just changed the whole room, you know. And I think each and every one of us has that power to do that, which is what Dale was talking about. Um, You know, coming in with a, a positive attitude and knowing that, You know, part of it, I think, is knowing that you belong and you have something to offer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, that's the one thing I I want every single person with dementia to understand, that you are still a powerful human being and have (laughs) much to offer. Karen? Right. And that other thing about being happy is it's like I'm an all or nothing person. Either I am in bed crying, eating, sleeping, drinking, or I am out partying, you know. Mm -hmm. But I can be happy just going to the Bayfront three minutes away and walking my dogs yeah. for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And uh, yeah. the rest of my day might be shitty, but I was good just for then. So I'm happy enough, little mm-hmm. pockets at a time. So. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's not something you have to do all day long, 24 7. I mean, emotions are a roller coaster and we all have them. Um, we just have to learn how to move through them. Right. right. So this was a good zoom. We we went right through this. Well, yep. we <laughs> goes by fast. Well, thank you all for your time and your your insights. I always appreciate it, and I always learn something. So until next time, uh, for our audience, I hope you learned something from this, and we'll like, click, and share this with others. Again, that's the way we bust down stigma is by sharing information and knowledge. So. Um, Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.